Good morning and welcome to worship. I am delighted that you're here. I'm Walt Jones. I'll be your preacher today. It's so good to be here with the strings and the choir and others who are leading our worship. I am grateful for our liturgist and all that we're doing today. Friendship cards are here for visitors. If you're here for the first time or you've never filled one of these out, it would delightful, be delightful for you to fill this out. It, it didn't exactly work for us to ask people to come up to a member of the membership committee in front. We tried. Why don't you hand this to me in the back of the church as we leave? And uh, we'll leave sort of in stages. We have a congregational meeting today. And this is the announcement of that meeting. You see it in the bulletin. But I want everybody to stay for lunch. Lunch is going to be so good today. So we'll have a brief congregational meeting. You may stay. Everything we do is public and, and welcome for everybody to stay. Or you may slip out and go early to lunch in the fellowship hall, which means you have to put this, give this to an usher or something else. We may not have thought all this out, but we're glad you're here. We want you to fill out a friendship uh, card, uh, one of these, and we want you to come to lunch. So much good things going on. It's delightful to see everybody, to worship God together. We're adding something to the worship service we haven't done in a long time. We're singing the Gloria Patre. I know that some people don't like change, but I'm adding it back. So there's, there's good change and good things happening. Um, we've got some children here for children's uh, moment, for, for children's sermon. We're close to being ready to having children's church or Sunday school for the kids uh, during the last two-thirds of worship. Here's what we need. Volunteers. Uh, we've got several people that want to teach, but we like to have multiple adults in the room with children in case a child needs to go to the bathroom, in case a child needs to come back to mommy. Lots of things. The only thing keeping us from having children's Sunday school is volunteers. So how do you sign up? You can call the church office. We'll get some more information. Talk to somebody on the Christian Education Committee. See me at lunch. We want to do this. We want to teach the Bible to our children. But we need your help. I think I have announced everything I need to announce. I have welcomed you. Welcome to church. Yes. Yeah. 
steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty doings of the Lord? Or declare all his praises. Happy are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. First uh, New Testament Bible reading is Matthew 5:17, and uh, it's on page five in the New Testament. If you want to read along, this is called the fulfillment of the law, and this is Jesus speaking. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And the second reading is from Exodus. And this is 19, 3 through 7. Then Moses went up to God. And the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenants, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. All through the whole earth is mine. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them the words of the Lord as he commanded him to speak.
I manage to learn them, and I can usually remember them now. Anybody else here have to memorize as a child? I see some hands. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Have no other gods before me. Don't make any idols and worship them. Don't take my name in vain. Honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor your parents. You can remember that, can't you? Don't, this is where I get in trouble with the order. Don't murder, don't steal, don't lie. Don't, there's where I forget. Don't commit adultery. Did I say that? Don't covet. Did I remember them? If I can remember them, so can you. Maybe there's somebody who can help give you a reason. Grayson, you can wait until you're a little bit bigger <laughs> to learn the Ten Commandments. But I think God gave us ten words because we have ten fingers and we can remember that. Wonderful commandments from God for us to have a community. So let's close in a prayer. I'll say a line and then you say a line, okay? You repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God, thank you for commandments. Thank you for commandments. Help us to memorize them. <laughs> and live by them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you were going to sing walking in the light <laughs> they sang that because I quoted it in a sermon two weeks ago as I talked about the spark of faith that's in our hearts you were listening <laughs> Wow! 
as we go to God in prayer, there are several folks that need prayers. I mentioned somebody in Sunday school, but I remembered that I wasn't supposed to share that too widely. So Sunday school members, pray for them, but, but remember that. And Jane Hutchinson is doing all right. She continues to be in rehab, uh, uh, hard rehab, hard recovery from a stroke, much of her right side, but she is making progress. So please pray for her, and she appreciates the calls and visits and other attention that she's gotten. Um, those are the announcements that I'm aware of. Uh, let's, let's pray. Lord God, we praise you. We praise you with all of ourselves, with our voices and our thoughts, with our actions and deeds. For you're a generous God, and we give you thanks for the richness of life and the beauty and the wonder of the world that we live in. For the care of those who love us for strength and hope in the trials and difficulties of life, for the gospel of the risen Lord, and for his presence with us through the Holy Spirit. We thank you and praise you for all these things. Loving God, we pray for all who are ill. Ease their pain and calm their restlessness. Give them such trust in you that they may know that they are always in your keeping. Bless all who care for them. Give them such trust in you that they may win new strength and may their love and tireless patience bring your grace and comfort to all who suffer. Shepherd of our souls, be with us in the dark valley, the valley of the shadow of death. Give your gentle companionship to all who are about to die. Be with us at our partings and Comfort with your presence all who grieve in loneliness or tears. Remember your church. Enable Christian people to walk with Christ in our daily lives, to work for the coming of Jesus' kingdom, strengthen the witness of the church in this place and all of your congregations across this country in a variety of denominations and worship styles, in many languages, here and around the world, we praise you and we pray for one another. Remember the nations of the world. Bring an end to all war and strife. Break down the barriers of race and creed that all may live as members of your family, O oh God. We pray especially for the people of Ukraine. We pray for all who resist tyranny and invaders. We pray for people in East Timor and across Ethiopia, an almost forgotten civil war that rages there, but we pray for them, for your church that's there and across Africa, for all of us. We pray with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My reading follows on vans immediately. God's people have gathered at the foot of the holy mountain. God has spoken a renewal of his covenant. And, and then our reading begins with Verse 1 of chapter 20. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that's in heaven above, that's on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down and worship them, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God, 
punishing children for the iniquity of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your son or daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien residing in your towns. For six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them, and on the seventh day rested. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, consecrated it. Honor your father and mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. Shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. Shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So without Leslie here, we sing together. Let's sing hymn number 66. Every time I feel the Spirit, let's stand. Moses was so excited to be back. He'd been here before on the mountain of God. Israel was free from Egypt, rescued at the sea. They wandered a bit in the wilderness and across and around the Arabian Peninsula. And then they came to the very mountain of God where Moses had encountered God at the burning bush. He must have said to Aaron, I know this place. I, I, you stay here and organize the camp. I'm going up to be with God. And Moses bounded up the mountain. This mountain, sometimes we call it Mount Sinai, but it's God's holy mountain. And Moses was there. I love this image and this idea of Moses heading out on a spiritual retreat, going up to the mountain where it all started. His spiritual life began 
when God spoke from the burning bush. You can just see Moses scampering back, looking for the bush, waiting for God to speak. Something about mountains that are special, aren't they? A place of spiritual retreat. Some of you have houses in the mountains, whether that's the Rockies or the Smokies or somewhere else. And from hot Ocala, it's fun to go to Montreat or to a Montreat conference or someplace else. And sometimes when we're quiet, God speaks in those holy places. But, but it's not just the mountains. On the shore of a lake, a river, the ocean, when we're quiet, we may very easily hear God talking to us through the Bible, through our prayers. Something very special about going off to be alone with God. And yes, mountains really are special places. So God, Moses mounted, bounded up the mountain, and sure enough, God spoke. You saw what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you out on eagles' wings. God says, I brought you to myself. Now obey my voice and keep my covenant, and you'll be my treasured possessions. Out of all the peoples of the world, the earth is mine, but you shall be a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. God is renewing the covenant again. We've heard this many times. Maybe you're tired of hearing about covenants and my preaching on it. I've been doing this all fall. But it's throughout the Old Testament, this idea of covenant. Matter of fact, covenant's the most important theological theme of the Hebrew Bible, God's covenant with his nation, his people, with us. In the first reading that Van read, Moses is, God is reminding Moses of what he did and how God desires to be in covenant relationship with his people. He wants them to worship him alone and be a holy people. Look very closely at the Bible. This is important. God seeks covenant and relationship before God gives the law. Covenant and relationship is first and foremost. The law is second. Grace and love come first. We sang the first hymn, which was written by John Calvin. I'm a Calvinist. I love John Calvin. I've read his institutes. I've studied what he did in Geneva and been to worship there. In John Calvin's first Presbyterian worship service that he designed, they gathered, they sang, they confessed their sins, they were forgiven, and then they read the Ten Commandments out loud. I almost had us read it together. Maybe we should have. But forgiveness and grace comes first. The law comes second. God is more about grace and forgiveness than he is about our keeping and following rules. We're forgiven. And then we read the commandments to check and see how we're going to live the coming week. I, I just love this, and it's clearly there in Exodus that covenant comes first, the rules come second. Many of us were raised being told again and again, God's going to get you, you better follow the rules, and it's almost like our parents couldn't make us behave enough, so they brought God down on top of us. And there's some churches today that are still all about following the rules. But I want y'all to hear the Bible very clearly. Covenant, grace, and love comes first, and then come the rules. Jesus put it this way. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Grace comes first. And grace comes through Jesus, who died and was raised for us. No matter how hard we try to keep the rules, we're not going to be good enough. But we don't have to be good enough because God loves us and sent Jesus. So let's pivot in the sermon to the commandments. I am not going to preach a 10-point sermon. I did that one time. It's the only time I fell asleep while preaching. <laughs> Our children were little. They didn't sleep much at night. I think we had two or three in diapers. And I had, for some crazy reason, chosen to preach on all Ten Commandments. And I remember standing in the pulpit at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Apopka and sort of waking up. And, and <sighs> So you get two points on the commandments. All ten of them are important, but two and four are wonderful. The first commandment, God says, I'm, I'm God. I rescued you. I brought you out of slavery, out of the house of bondage. Worship me. The first commandment for us is in response to God's rescue and God's love. God brought them across the Red Sea. God sent Jesus to save us. God is the primary actor. You and I could never build a bridge all the way across the sea. Certainly Moses and they couldn't. Even with modern technology, it couldn't be done. And you and I can't build a stairway to heaven. We are reliant on Jesus coming down to us to save us. God says, I rescued you. Don't worship anyone else. No idols either. That's the second commandment. And the third is about taking God's name in vain. Then God says, keep the Sabbath holy. It's, it's a Sabbath even for me, says God. I rested on the seventh day, and so should you. God rests. Uh, I love that about the first of several creation stories that are in Genesis. In the one with the seven days. In, at the end, for all God has made, God rested. God says so should you. Your bodies need rest. Your minds need rests. And it's such a contrast to what the people had experienced in Egypt. They had been slaves who were worked to death by Pharaoh and his taskmasters. The Egyptians exhausted Israel, trying to produce enough bricks to make temples and statues and pyramids. And every day they had to work. And Pharaoh made their work harder. And they were exhausted. It's interesting, and I wanted to spend more time with this last week, how God cares for the slaves. When God went to Egypt, he went to the slave quarters, not Pharaoh's palace. He's concerned about the underdog, the displaced, the ones without hope. God even expressed his concern for the animals. Were you listening? You rest, and your children rest, and your slaves rest, and your animals, and even the immigrant who's in your town. Because God's people groaned out. Walter Brueggemann writes, Into the system of hopelessness and weariness that was Egypt erupts the God of the burning bush. God heard the despairing fatigue of the, slee, the slaves resolved to liberate the company of Israel from the exploitive system. God recruited Moses for the human task of emancipation. 
the reason Miriam and the other women could sing and dance at the end of the rescue at the Red Sea is the emergence of a new social reality in which the life of the Israelite economy is not determined or compelled by the insatiable production quotas of Egypt and its gods. This gift of Sabbath set Israel apart from every nation, and it's a gift for us as Christians too. There was a historian and traveler in the ancient world, and I wish I knew, uh, I can't find this story, but I heard it in a sermon long ago. But this traveler was going around to different lands and, and reporting back to Rome and reported of this one strange place he visited where on one day there was no noise. There was no sound of hammers and workmen, no call of livestock herders or bleeding of animals in the streets. No sounds of children running to school. No oxen plowing in the fields. No smoke from cooking fires. The city market was empty. Occasionally, prayers could be heard in homes and in the temple. Otherwise, silence all day in a city called Jerusalem. I wish I could find that story and know more about it, be able to footnote it for you. But I find it remarkable that the work of slaves and animals, men and women, stopped for one day. And they worshiped God and made that day holy to God. They rested and the city was quiet. What a wonderful way to set themselves apart. What a wonderful way to set ourselves apart. I started this sermon with Moses bounding up the mountain of God like a teenager. I know this place. It's God's mountain. In mountains and other places, shores, our home, when we turn off the TV and other noise, when we sit quietly, maybe with our Bibles open or a study book, it's amazing how God can touch us. Maybe just with peace and relaxation, whether it's for an hour or a whole day. I know it's hard. Hey, I work on Sundays all day. It's very hard, and I have to make some time to be quiet and be with God, to open my Bible, not preparing a sermon or a Sunday school lesson, but just to be quiet and draw close to God. Because God wants to be in a relationship with you and me. He wants to rekindle that spark of faith and love in our hearts. God sent Jesus to, to save us, to bridge that gap between humanity and heaven. And the Bible and God and Jesus aren't here to judge us like a unhappy teacher or parent, but God is full of grace and love and wants to be in relationship. So let's all worship God, and draw close to him through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
meeting in just a minute. Our strangers are going to play the tongue salute. If you're a visitor, you want to hand me a friendship card as we leave. But maybe I just would play the band. My visitors may go in just a minute. But let's all remember the grace of God, the covenant that came before the commandments, the love that God has through us, for us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Be blessed. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>